Thanks, Julie and uh, Dean Rutherford, and thanks all for coming out on this beautiful, sunny Arkansas day to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Washington, D.C. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm Jason Grumet, and uh, I am here to tell you that all is not lost. I'm here to tell you that while things are tough in Washington, they've been tougher before, and in fact there are, I think, some real embers of uh, possibility if you know, people like uh, those of you in this room, in fact, start to call for them. But let me tell you a little bit about what uh, I plan to chat with you about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Bipartisan Policy Center. I know it is not uh, a household name yet, um, but we want to give you a sense of really what were the inspirations and aspirations of uh, our organization. And then I'll say a little bit about what uh, you know, might happen in Congress in the next few months. You'll note that I bring no slides. I, I like uh, plausible deniability when making political projections, but I see that there are cameras in the back, so I will try to do my best. Um, so as Julie mentioned, um, my personal background is in energy policy. And in fact, the Bipartisan Policy Center grew out of an effort that uh, began back in 2001 focusing on, on energy policy. A number of the nation's big philanthropies had been spending tens of millions of dollars trying to advance uh, energy policy agenda. And the country at that time was careening between Kyoto and Anwar as kind of the two poles of division and very little was being accomplished in between. And I managed to get uh, involved in that discussion and proposed that they try to do something a little different. Everyone was talking about venture philanthropy at the time. And so, you know, my sense was here, well, we'll venture this. Um, venture that we put together a group that is so bizarrely diverse that it literally might not be able to agree to anything at all. But that if it could agree, it would actually have some political meaning. Uh, there is nothing less important or less inspiring in Washington, D.C. than getting 20 centrists together. Nobody cares. I mean, no, not even the people in the room, because everyone recognizes that that's not going to have any meaningful political traction. But if you can, in fact, pull together a group that truly, you know, I wouldn't say 100% of the political spectrum, because the 5% on either side are truly nuts. So, you know, 87% of the political spectrum. Um, you know, maybe you can get something done. And we, we did pretty well. We got a group that included everybody from uh, Andrew Lundquist, who's become a good friend of mine, who was uh, Dick Cheney's energy lead, the guy who, you know, wrote that kind of secret plan, and uh, Ralph Cavana, who was the head of the Natural Resources Defense Council's energy project. We had CEOs from the nation's biggest nuclear power company, oil company. We had folks representing the coal industry. We had Nobel laureate scientists. You know, it was a really, truly diverse group and people who had meaningful engagement in the political process. Um, and so it worked pretty well. We spent about two and a half years. We put together a study that was a comprehensive plan. Everybody acknowledged that we would not have been able to get agreement around any single element of the plan. The only way that agreement was forged was people looked across the table and saw that their colleagues were as uncomfortable with the recommendations as they were. Um, but we had the good fortune of bumping in into the 2005 energy bill. There have been a couple of failed attempts to pass energy legislation. Energy does have some history of bipartisanship because it is often seen as more regional than political. It's where the coal is, it's where the gas is, it's where the cities are. Um, and Senators Domenici and Bingaman, who were the chair and ranking member of the Energy Committee, um, really wanted to get something done. So our report got, you know, waved around in the well of the Senate. People um, used it to advocate for opposing positions, which I thought was, um, suggested it was a nuanced document. Um, and we managed to actually have some influence uh, on that uh, major piece of legislation. So let me just kind of step back for a minute and tell you why I think that process worked, because it really became the basis for what uh, we've done now. Um, it worked in part because everyone joined up knowing there was a political component to the exercise. That if in fact the group could come to consensus, there was an expectation that everybody would join together and work to advocate those recommendations. In my experience, and this is an overstatement, many times in Washington the people who know the most do the least. And the people who know the least do the most. There are no um, absence of incredibly thoughtful groups of people who write studies and hit print and then presume that because of the brilliance of their work, somebody's going to care. Um, there is just a cacophony of information flying around the hill. And unless you actually have the relationships to bring that information forward in a manner that people care about, these are often um, kind of dusty shelf exercises. Um, 
it's important that the people in the group really trust in the substantive quality of what's being put together. This means that these processes often take longer than you'd like because you have to kind of chase down every little red rubber ball. These commissions kind of, they, they test the staff to see if in fact the fealty is, is there. They'll never read the 4,000 page technical appendix they get you to write, but they know it's there. And an important part of these processes, you can't whip these things together in three to six months. Um, they have to trust their colleagues that there's actually a chemistry there that's going to you know, encourage people to, if not support each other, at least not undermine each other. Um, and then finally, there has to be a leadership component. Um, and that usually goes along the lines of, you know, if not us, who? Because every one of these projects is working on an issue that the real government is failing to address. And the real government has some, some real liabilities. It's almost impossible for congressional committees to meet in private. They're always in front of TVs, which generally diminishes candor and risk taking and, you know, uh, honest questioning. Um, there are way too many committees. So the members of Congress have no time. You know, they're on six or seven different committees. Oftentimes these committees are seen as fundraising opportunities. You know, I sit on the banking committee and therefore you can go to the banking industry and I sit on the agriculture committee and you can go to the agriculture industry. But the committee structure, it's no longer really a working process. And then of course, you know, the fake government doesn't have to stand for election. So there is an opportunity, I think, to be somewhat more politically um, courageous than if you really know every two years you have to uh, appeal to all of you nice people. Um, and so the process um, revealed to me what I thought were some actually, you know, meaningful lessons. They seem very obvious, but oftentimes most of them, you know, the, the most robust things I've learned after the fact seem incredibly obvious. And so what we decided to do was like any good DC institution, violate our own term limits and expand our mandate. You know, we had done this on energy policy and had the sense and the hope that maybe there was a set of ideas here that were replicable. We had been working with Senators Daschle and Dole who were helping us think through um, the relationship between agriculture and energy. And then we just had a little kind of, you know, epiphany that, well, you know, if we could get Baker and Mitchell, that'd be pretty nifty. And, you know, Senator Baker is a very a strong voice on civility and had been giving a number of speeches about that and we were able to make that connection. And we were having a hard time getting to Senator Mitchell. And Senator Daschle had sent him a letter and we, you know, he was just moving around a lot. And I saw him on the agenda of the Clinton Global Initiative. And I stalked him, <laughs> which was, which I had to say was very, very uncomfortable. You know, I'm, I, entourage, you know, is just not something I've ever really done before. And I kind of had to like sneak into the green room and thank God the first person I bumped into happened to be his assistant who very nicely introduced, but it, it was awkward, but it worked. And the four of them decided to come together um, and help us found the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, and I have to say at the outset, none of them knew what they were getting into either. I mean, bipartisanship is something which resonates deeply with everybody in concept and scares the heck out of everybody in practice. And, you know, these four, you know, really just remarkable leaders did in fact know each other, which made this, um, this possible. But so they joined together and, uh, you know, where we are now um, is that we have a number of different projects I'll just mention. Um, but I guess I should really stress that you know, we are the bipartisan policy center. We are not the nonpartisan policy center or the postpartisan policy center or the metapartisan policy center or all the Bloomberg Schwarzenegger, you know, partisan things. We think partisanship is good. It's the essential engine of the democracy. None of our four leaders, you know, lacked their partisan moments. It is through that collision of ideas um, that we get stuff done. The sense right now is that that partisanship has become somewhat toxic. And that's really what in some ways we're hoping that we can play some role uh, in unraveling. Um, and also just note that, you know, a lot of people think this is the worst it's ever been. And that is a human condition. You know, we have 100-year floods every dozen years, and we have the coldest winter in, you know, history once every 10. Um, and we have the most partisan Congress you've ever seen, you know, every 15 or 20 years. You know, there have not been any duels recently. No one has beat anybody over the head with canes recently. Um, we've been through these moments before. And, you know, I think we do have the ability uh, to climb out of them, but the Congress needs our help. And not only, you know, from a sense of kind of being electorally engaged, but Congress needs groups to 
to cut their food. I mean, there's just too much going on. There's not a single piece of legislation that Congress passes that wasn't drafted by somebody outside of Congress. Now, they, of course, you know, do many, many different things to it, but the, but the engine of staffing Congress is first done by thousands of people around the country and then filtered by a smaller number of people within the Congress and then by the members themselves. And there is an incredible industry in Washington to support people on the right and the left. So, you know, you have, and these are, these are smart, you know, thoughtful groups with strong ideological views, but you have, you know, the, you know, Heritage Institute, you have the uh, American Enterprise Institute, you have the Center for American Progress, and they are there to help the combatants arm them with real facts so that they can advance what they believe is a necessary and constructive uh, conflict of ideas. But there's no infrastructure to encourage anybody to work across the aisle. So if, actually to do the hardest thing, it's a lot easier to play with your team, but to do the hardest thing, to actually venture an idea which is not entirely consistent with one's own team or one's base, you're basically flying solo. And that's one of the reasons it doesn't happen a lot. Because anytime you do it, you know, the avalanches of left and right start rolling down after the mountain and you, know, you need somebody to, to push you along. So one of the things that we hope we can do is just provide that infrastructure and support for the members of Congress, and there are many of them, who would like to take those kinds of chances if they thought that they were uh, survivable and if they could be successful. Rarely do people want to put themselves at risk to lose. So they basically need to have a belief that there is a team behind them that can help them get something across the line. So I'll say a few words just about kind of who's leading our different projects and then turn to a few thoughts about Congress. Um, we continue to have our energy project, which remains our um, most significant effort. It is co-chaired um, by a former uh, Democratic Deputy Secretary of uh, Department of Energy under President Clinton former EPA administrator under President Bush, and the CEO of a large electric power company. So a very kind of diverse and substantively expert group. Um, our transportation group was put together in advance of this upcoming highway bill, which keeps getting pushed down the road, no pun intended, but the highway bill is busted, right? The authorization for the law has run out, and the money for the law has run out. So we're funding our highway system now principally through, well not principally, but significantly through general revenue funds, which is not the way that whole idea was supposed to form. It needs to be reauthorized. It's a tough piece of legislation um, because it's a big piece of legislation to pass. Uh, but So we have a group together. It's uh, former Senator Slade Gordon, former Congressman Sherry Bowler, who is a moderate Republican from New York, uh, Congressman Martin Sabo from Wisconsin, and Dennis Archer, the former mayor of Detroit. And this project really kind of, the shape of it is consistent with what we often try to do, which is we try to have people who have a lot of political engagement, um, and then we try to have a bunch of wonks who really know the guts of the idea. It's, it's the combination of those two cultures that we think generate smart and politically viable policy. And that's not always easy, um, because they don't always speak the same language. So it really often is kind of integrating both the political sanity and the substance of sanity into one, one package. We also sometimes try to bring people who need to be at the table but just aren't. So the highway bill has usually been a fight between road builders, railroads, environmentalists. I mean, pretty much, you know, not, nothing wrong with special interests, but very special interests. The ultimate users, the big companies who are productive or are not productive because you can or can't get your goods to market. Um, the big employers who see their employees spend two or you know, hours every day commuting. Um, these folks have never really been part of the transportation bill. They're the ultimate, as are we all, kind of beneficiaries or victims of transportation policy. So we try to broaden the debate sometimes, see if you can change the politics a little bit. National security has always been an area where the country has been able to come together. You know, it is not a cliche, but an off-stated idea that, you know, politics should end you know, at the water's edge, and when the president goes overseas, we are united as a country. Um, that idea has suffered some of late, uh, but there's still something, I think, very meaningful there. We're working on a project looking at um, the ramifications of Iranian uh, nuclear ambitions that is being chaired by a former four-star general, Chuck Wald, uh, former Democratic Senator Chuck Robb, and now a new um, senator from Indiana, Dan Coats. He had to leave the project. But that's put together a 
set of ideas that have not been met with partisan resistance to any significant degree. We also have the good fortune of having uh, Lee Hamilton and Tom Kane, who chair the 9-11 Commission now, running their project. Uh, their kind of further efforts to uh, improve homeland security out of our operation. And again, that's an opportunity, we think, not only to advance good policy, but they have kind of iconic bipartisanship behind them. And so we're hoping that that uh, continues. We are working on health care, which is tough right now. The focus we have is working at the state level, working with governors who have to, whether they love it or hate it, engage with this new federal law. And governors do tend historically to be voices of pragmatism when uh, they come to Washington. So we're trying to kind of embellish that. Um, we have a project that's focusing broadly on democracy because we've come to realize that having good policy ideas is neat, but unless the Congress functions, it doesn't matter much. Um, so looking at some ideas, uh, former uh, Congressman and Ag Secretary Gang Glickman, former Governor and Senator from Idaho Dirk Kempthorne, and co-founder of AOL Steve Case are leading this effort, which is looking at issues like redistricting. It's looking at a lot of inside baseball stuff, but I think it's very important, which is just the congressional rules. Because if I were to point to the biggest problem in Washington, it's that the members don't spend any time together. And it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, they're, you know, the schedule is now in Tuesday, out Thursday. Most of them don't live in Washington anymore. Uh, we have a number of people coming to Congress saying, my goal is to spend as little time in Washington as possible. That's not likely to make them very good legislators. Um, I mean, so this idea that we have people with disdain, disdain for the process you know, coming to um, you know, you know, lay down markers, I think, is, is going to be a challenge. But the members of Congress actually like each other a lot more than you know, MSNBC and Fox would suggest. There is a lot of bipartisan legislation that's introduced you know, at a lower level, um, not necessarily always with the embrace of leadership. But there are just very few venues for them to spend time together. Um, the parties now have caucus lunches. They used to have bipartisan caucus lunches. Now they have separate lunches just about uh, every day they're in session. Um, yeah, Republicans and Democrats living together, it used to happen. You know, there were you know, famous spots on Capitol Hill where you had, you know, if you're going to go to have a real battle of ideas, if you basically respect one another, you can have that battle harsh disagreements and still come out with something or even if you don't come out with something you can still work together again the next day you know and there are strong examples we had you know Dolan Moynihan uh, on social security we had Hatch and Kennedy working together on health care um, it's become an endangered species to the point that now if you want to be bipartisan in Congress you have to form a gang I don't know if you've heard that there was a gang of 14 that was trying to kind of navigate the you know, Supreme Court appointments. There was a gang of eight that was trying to put together an energy bill. I mean, you know, you really need to, you need your peeps. You need to be tough. It's not something you can do without, uh, you know, really kind of manning up. Um, so we're trying to provide some opportunities for people to spend time together, which again, sounds kind of warm and cozy, but, um, I, you know, I think it matters. We were able to run a series of six or seven private dinners for the House Financial Services Committee before they really started banging heads together on the finance bill, where we were able to get, you know, Volcker and Greenspan and, you know, a lot of big shots to come in. They sat around the table. They sat next to each other. They actually asked real questions. You know, you, I don't know if you've ever been to a congressional hearing. They basically, you know, someone once described a congressional hearing to me as the following, which is, you know, a number of congressmen invite world experts to come sit before them and then lecture them for two hours on you know, the, the facts of the issue. These are gotcha questions most of the time or they're softball questions. You're my witness or you're the other team's witness. The hearing process is not actually a generative intellectual process where people ask questions that they don't think they know the answer to. Um, and folks love this process and they've asked us if we can do you know, other versions of it. Um, last week, just for fun, we. Uh, brought about 20 of the country's um, kind of political hatchets down to uh, New Orleans. James Carville and Mary Matlin have hosted this with us for the second year. And we kind of, last year was taking poison out of partisanship. This year it was beyond the ballot making Washington work. And you know, these are the folks, if you watch cable TV, you know well. I mean, it was, you know, Ed Gillespie, Paul Begala. Actually, I saw in the Clinton Library looking like a mountain man with a beard. Um, Dan Bartlett, Hillary Rosen. I mean, these are, you know, people who 
generally see themselves as, uh, as warriors, um, they actually didn't know each other that well, which surprised me. Um, they complained last year that having realized that the other guy or woman was nice, was really going to undermine their job going forward, they realized that some, they, some of them came with scores to settle, um, which made us a little nervous. Um, most of those turned out to have literally been misunderstandings. I mean, when campaigns are moving with so much emotion and so much speed, little, you know, hiccups can really make people furious. And they actually found out that, like, really? He meant to say that? And, you know, they, so some of these, like, deep-seated, they've been holding these grudges for, you know, two years. It was like, oh, well, maybe next time I'll give you a call. Um, and it, again, simple human nature stuff that I actually think matters a bunch. Um, and finally, on the projects, we will be releasing our own uh, debt study tomorrow. This is one of the bigger projects we've been working on. Senator Pete Domenici, who was former chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Alice Rivlin, who was the first director uh, of the uh, Office of Budget and Management, and a broad group that has that combination of real you know, policy experts and uh, you know, politicians, conservatives like Frank Keating and Carlos Gutierrez, uh, progressives like Mark Morial, and uh, a host of other, uh, you know, people around the table uh, from labor and other key institutions. Unless they all freaked out last night, we'll be coming together in a consensus body uh, to support a set of, I think, very comprehensive and thoughtful um, recommendations on the debt. Um, this is going to by no means make us popular in the special interest community, but our view is it's time for adult arithmetic. And I think the Bowles Simpson Commission took a step in this direction, but our effort is to put together a comprehensive plan that will keep the debt from spiraling out of control, um, that will do so in a way that maintains the basic progressivity in the current uh, tax code, that maintains the fundamental values um, that I think hold up the nation, um, and protect us from the you know, wheels coming off, which is what we really think is, uh, is possible. Um, and we want to be an existence proof. You know, I think the Bowles Simpson Commission is going to get quite fractious now as they try to actually get their members to endorse something. And we'd like to be there to say, look, well, look, this is the fake government. We know we don't have to stand for election, but these are serious people with real political commitments who are all willing to embrace this plan. And, you know, if you hate, you know, what's being proposed for, you know, a particular issue, yeah, well, we don't like it either. So what would you propose instead? You know, that's the kind of adult arithmetic um, part of the equation. An interesting moment will occur in the next Congress, and I want to kind of make the transition through this debt discussion for a few minutes. And this is the debt ceiling. So, you know, even if everybody decided that they embraced our plan tomorrow, we were still going to need to actually go further into debt before these measures could take effect. And the kind of, you know, uh, IOU limit that we have, um, we hit that ceiling probably in March or April at which point Congress has to raise the debt ceiling, allow the country to go farther into debt, or we default, which would cause a you know, remarkable downward spiral in global markets and kind of financial chaos, the likes of which we really probably have never seen before. Um, so that just can't happen. But a lot of people have come to Congress you know, running on this notion of you know, kill the debt, kill spending, and they're going to have to raise their hands and vote to lift the debt ceiling. I think this is the dog catches car moment. Welcome to Washington for um, a number of these members, but it also will put tremendous pressure and opportunity on the White House and the rest of the system to do some unpopular measures to reduce spending. So I think that's gonna be an interesting moment in the first real battle uh, in the kind of budget uh, wars that I think will grip the nation uh, for several years to come. All right, so if kind of two or three minutes um, just about the upcoming Congress, and then love to have a, a conversation. Um, so here are, the, here are the reasons why you might imagine Congress could function as well or, or better, hopefully better. One is that, you know, divided government is actually often a, a pretty good thing. Um, and I put it another way, there's probably no worse number for Democrats to have in the Senate than 60. Because, you know, you run the government. So the last thing you're going to do is go sit down with, you know, the other side and kind of try to work something out, you know, and your base would just kill you. Um, you can imagine the, you know, kind of Mother Jones, you know, President Bush would have never compromised if he had 60 Republicans, you know, very hard. But you can't get anything done with 60. 
because, you know, five to ten of those 60, depending on the issue, you know, are purple. You know, and, uh, you know, you saw what, what, you know, the president had to go through on, on health care, but, uh, you know, you either want, you know, 55 or 65. I think, you know, anything in the middle is actually, uh, actually harder. So we actually will have divided government, which places a burden on both parties. I mean, it was very easy for the Republican Party to basically play just defense for much of the last two years because, you know, the other guys had the, had the ball. They weren't, you know, reaching out to them in their view too much. And so, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, now both sides have some political investment in actually governing, which I think could be a good thing. Um, Speaker elect Boehner and others have been very clear this is not 1994. Last time there was a big Republican you know, route, um, Gingrich and folks came in with what they really believed was a real mandate. I mean, they really believed that it was. Um, you remember the contract with America. And 1995 was a train wreck. You know, this government got shut down and it was not what we would aspire to. Uh, Boehner seems to get the fact that this is no mandate. You know, that four years ago it was a rejection of President Bush, you know, even though I think you know, President Obama found some really kind of affirmative soaring rhetoric to you know, energize the rejection of Bush, much of that election was really a rejection of the Bush years. This election is a rejection of democratic control of government. And um, I think the Republicans know that their own party is polling, you know, 40% or below. Um, and so there is a sense that, you know, if the Republicans just come in and try to knock over the town with unemployment still at, you know, 9% and an angry population, they'll get kicked out in two years. So they get, they seem to get that, which I think is a very important, you know, almost every victor in our last, you know, couple of political cycles has overstated their mandate. Um, and it seems to me that that's been figured out, let's, let's hope. Um, Boehner has also made some pretty, I think, uh, appealing speeches that he's going to have a really an open process. And one of the things that's fallen down in Congress lately is just the basic regular order. Um, it's really up to the majority party whether the minority party in the House gets to offer amendments or not. Um, and generally the answer has been not so much lately. Um, Boehner is asserting that he's going to make sure that if Democrats have substantive amendments, they, you know, they will be uh, debated. Um, I think that would be a tremendous achievement uh, if, it's, if it's possible. And it also signals a sense, again, that you know, we're not just going to kind of bop you over the head just because we can. We'll see how that goes. Um, and then maybe the most important, and you know, it's nice to think about this in the uh, you know, Clinton uh, School of Public Service and a very nice tour of the library. Look at 1996. President Clinton and then Speaker Gingrich both realized we got to get something done. And they did. Um, and I think there is a sense from Democrats and Republicans that if there's just another two years of train wreck, you know, they're all um, somewhat vulnerable. Here's the bad news. Um, the disconnect between rhetoric and reality from a number of the you know, folks on both sides who just got elected is just huge. Let me take the debt for a moment. You know, get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse. One percent, ladies and gentlemen, at best. You know? um, and so as people kind of crash into the reality of these challenges, and the debt ceiling is just one example, um, that's going to take a little while. It's also true that we have a lot, you know, we have a hundred new members in the House and almost 40 of them have never held elected office. Now that could be like, you know, Mr. Smith, citizen legislature, that, maybe, that could be great, or it could not be great. And um, my guess is it'll be, it'll be mixed. Um, the uh, two other issues that are gonna be tough is just, you know, 2012, uh, you have uh, 23 Democratic senators up in 2012. I think there's a pretty strong expectation that if politics in the future stayed to be similar than politics in the past, that Republicans would probably take over um, the Senate. I think they believe for the first time that they actually have a potentially real chance to capture the White House. Uh, Senator McConnell, unfortunately, I think, uh, voiced what I'm sure most minority leaders you know, believe, which is our goal is to take over the White House. But you know, you know, it's not nice to say that. You know, it, 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 it does, I mean, it's, you know, look, a, a lot of, Politics is decorum, and he's, he walked that back some, but I think that that focus is going to be tough. And then uh, finally, you know, just pride and rigidity. You know, we at the Bipartisan Policy Center are basically talking about, you know, principal compromise and maintaining your values while finding interesting solutions, and, you know, we're out of step. 
a lot of people um, are coming to Washington saying, you know, I'm here to make sure that in no way, shape, or form I work with the other side. Um, again, I think that will be overblown. I think that will fade, but that's tough. And so just kind of in closing, you know, a word about the White House. Um, you know, President Clinton, you know, invented in the public mind this you know, tr idea of triangulation, which was often kind of seen as kind of a cynical, people said that was kind of a cynical voice. I mean, to my mind, if you have Democrats and Republicans in government and most of the people in the middle, that's the only way you make public policy. I mean, you know, it seems like it's the most kind of, you know, obvious step forward, but it was basically in 1996 when President Clinton advanced welfare reform and actively um, worked you know, against what the kind of the base of his party stood for. I think that really changed um, the possibilities of his, uh, his presidency going forward. And that's going to be the, the issue for President Obama. Um, I think it is unfair to say that this has been the most liberal administration in all times. And if you look at you know, a number of decisions they've made, President Obama has uh, rejected the labor union's number one priority, this kind of card check bill, uh, basically didn't support uh, in a meaningful way the public option. He hasn't moved forward on his campaign commitments uh, on don't ask, don't tell. Uh, the energy and climate debate um, didn't see you know, a really strong political capital White House push. I mean, so the president did not you know, kind of grasp at every you know, part of the progressive agenda and actually progressive community is quite upset about that. But he also didn't initiate big ideas that were inconsistent with what people perceive to be the democratic base. And I think, that's, I think that's the difference, is whether you actually kind of actively lead from the center or whether you somewhat more passively step back and try to capture the center. What I've, I think, seen the White House trying to do is, you know, let Congress move things forward, assume there's going to be this kind of left-right dialectic, you know, things will crash together, there'll be a center forming, and then the president could come in and kind of nail that down. And that works if you have a center in the Congress. If you don't, you just have people banging heads together. And the only um, voice that has real political authority who can lead like that, I think, is the White House. And I, you know, my hope and expectation that you're going to see the White House being more affirmative and putting out its own legislative agenda. Um, so having started with Rousseau, I will give you my own um, little notion of, uh, I think, optimism. And this is not a direct quote, but uh, de Tocqueville, um, who had probably the most best quotes about this country than any Frenchman uh, in history, um, basically said that you know, the greatness of this country is not that it's the most enlightened, but it's America's ability uh, to repair her faults. And you know, I think that really is true. And I think that um, we had that opportunity. And you know, again, I think all of us in the room have to bear some of the burden uh, to fulfill that uh, expectation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. We do have time for a couple questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Susan, right there. How are you funded? Well, um, individuals contribute, sir. If that's a, an offer, I'll meet you in the hall. Um, we are principally funded by uh, foundations. About 85% of our budget comes from big philanthropies, you know, the Rockefeller, Hewlett, Packard foundations. About 10% come from individuals and corporations. Bob, right here. Bob. What's your relationship with lobbyists? Some of my best friends are lobbyists. Um, you know, I, uh, I certainly understand the frustration that people have with Washington and the extent to which that frustration is then, you know, cast upon lobbyists who, like all people, span the spectrum from the most wonderful people to you ever met to the most venal people you've ever met. You know, they're, they're people. Um, it is certainly true that the system has created you know, undue access to lobbyists through campaign money. Um, I think, though, it's a mistake to assume that anybody who is representing anybody else should not have a voice in the political process. I mean, you know, I have you know, friends at the American Lung Association who can't be on any you know, federal public health advisory boards. I uh, have friends in the oil and gas industry who know more about oil and gas than anybody else. They're absolute experts, great policy folks who couldn't participate in the president's you know, commission on the oil spill. 
Um, so you, you run this risk if you overdo your yikes, I see a lobbyist, um, of basically only being able to bring together people who know very little about the issue. And so I think that um, it's really appropriate to make sure that people can't leave government and all of a sudden start lobbying government. I mean, I think all those are appropriate, but I, I take a slightly different uh, perspective than the current administration. Hi, my name is Mark Linhart. I'm a student here at the Clinton School. Thank you for coming. Uh, you mentioned your debt reduction uh, proposal coming out tomorrow. I was wondering if you could share some specifics about that, about where to cut federal spending uh, and that sort of thing. Well, in a, in a Twitter, f you know, uh, Live America, I'm uh, not inclined to go into a lot of specifics, except to say that um, here's where the money is. It's Social Security, health care, defense, and um, domestic uh, discretionary spending. Um, I mean, th those, those are the four categories. And so, you know, when you seek to make meaningful cuts, you have to engage all of those issues. Um, we've also taken the position from the beginning that, you know, everything is on the table, which is the colloquial way of saying, you can't do all of this through cuts and you can't do all of this through revenue. You know, you simply, you know, and we tried, you know, as kind of an existence, you know, proof, we tried to put together a budget that would be balanced with just spending cuts. And it just undid, you know, the fabric of, uh, you know, American life. It just, you know, government couldn't, no role in health or social security or education um, that was, you know, sustainable. And we looked at what it would do, you know, if you had to do it all through tax increases, if you had no cuts, and, you know, you would see upper brackets in the 80 percent, I mean, you know, equally uh, ridiculous. You know, we were able to put together a plan that does substantially more through cuts than through revenue. Um, but I think that's really the challenge. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Kim Caldwell. I'm also a Clinton School student. And uh, a lot of our curriculum here is about communication and how to get folks who maybe have different interests to talk about solutions. And you referenced uh, kind of this idea of getting people past the, uh, the partisan rhetoric and getting people to talk about solutions that are creative. And I'm curious if you can share with us uh, and everyone else here kind of what you've learned about what's effective and getting people to drop those positions and start to talk more about interests and what can work. Well, I mean, I think it, it's rare that I've ever met anybody who I didn't ultimately find out to be about one third right. You know, I mean, it, it, you really got to work hard to, you know, find somebody who's having a substantive, you know, disagreement who is not making, I think, some uh, you know, meaningful, and important points. And that, you know, that worldview. I think matters as, as much as anything. Um, you know, I, I heard you do the um, you know, classic uh, getting to yes, you know, separate you know, positions from interests. And um, you know, I, I think that that certainly does um, help to see if at the outset of a process one can define you know, what the goals are. Um, and then you know, different pieces that fit those goals. You know, one thing that we stumbled into, which seems very important, is um, you know, how do you let people in a process like we do kind of relax. And, you know, the first thing is um, we commit that we're never going to put their name on anything without their explicit engagement and not, you know, not silence equals acceptance. I mean, active sign off. Um, everybody who participates in any one of our projects is given the right to write a separate report, which could say, I did this for half the time. These people are horrible Americans. I've vociferously dissented. That's never happened. But the the knowledge that anybody can, in fact, express themselves individually as part of the collective, I think, has also been um, really important. Um, and then, you know, finally, facts do matter. And, and if you have an iterative process, you know, so if you have people in a closed room six times a year with real research going on, it's hard for people to maintain ideological positions that are in contradiction of facts three times in a row. You know, you get, you get through the first meeting, you know, saying, but like the third time it comes back, the rest of the room is just says, this, you know, doesn't work. And in my experience, people do tend to ultimately abide by what uh, seems to be kind of compelling substance. What happens when they don't want to accept the facts? Well, anybody doesn't want to accept Well, we have them. a rendition program. Um, <laughs> 
the uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that obviously that that's the challenge uh, with the real government. And you know, and we accept we're the fake government. You know, I mean, I think what we do is hard and interesting. But you know, there are any number of former legislators who are now desperately enthusiastic about bipartisanship, um, who you know didn't find ways to express that enthusiasm when they actually held office. And so the question of how we translate these ideas um, you know, to the Hill and the White House is obviously the goal. But again, the one thing I'll just repeat is, you know, the key is to get people interested and trusting enough to actually ask their real questions. You know, in my experience, I don't think we've hardly ever made progress in any kind of environment pushing information at people. But if you can create the relationship so that they actually ask you something, then the little puzzle piece in the brain is, is open and you, know, you can have a kind of discussion. So um, you know, our experience is to you know, use personal interesting relationships, build upon those relationships, and then when people ask you for something, damn well better you know, produce it. Um, and uh, you build those relationships and then you hope those people stay in office for a little while. I'm curious what you would say to some of the newly elected people with no political experience who made some pretty stringent pledges uh, in, in, uh, on both sides. I'm thinking specifically of people who said, you know, no tax raises, no increases, no way. Um, if, if what you're saying or suggesting about your policy report is true and, and, and that would be necessary to sort of um, uh, keep us in a good position. Uh, what do you say to people whose rhetoric has sort of gotten in front of them, and how do you appeal to them when they're in a, such a politically vulnerable position? Well, I'm not suggesting that this would work, but um, you know, I think what I would say is that you, know, you made you know, dozens of commitments in your race, and the one that I imagine you take more seriously than any other was your commitment to tell your constituents the truth. And this is the truth. And if you actually, you know, believe that that's the relationship you want to have with your constituents, you have to find a way to uh, indicate, you know, change circumstances. And there are, you know, no one's going to be, you know, on this debt issue, everyone's going to get something, you know, back. I mean, the folks who have been really resistant uh, on the debt, to the extent that they have to vote for raising the debt ceiling, they will extract something consistent with their own interests. And, I actually, despite the, I think the rigidity was part of, um, when you're saying no to something, rigidity often makes a lot more sense than when you're trying to figure out how to actually accomplish things. So, and I think even in the districts where people were elected on the basis of, I won't work with those guys, if folks come home and say, these are the three things we accomplished, I, most of the time I think you know, those people actually fare pretty well with the public. Well, thank you, Jason, for coming down and, and giving us that lecture. Thank all y'all for coming out, and we will see you at the next one. Thanks again. Thanks.